guys, Rob Arnold here. In my last two videos, I showed you how I take a riff from my head, then record it into the computer, and then how I built upon it to create a full song. In the first video, I started with one riff, recorded it into Pro Tools, set up a session, found the tempo, added a lead melody and bass and drums. And then in the second video, I took that initial riff idea and turned it into a full song by adding verses, choruses, and a solo section. You guys told me that you liked what you saw and you learned a lot, but you wanted me to get heavier with it. And so here I am to do just that, but this time I'm gonna do it even quicker. Here we are with the same session template as before. It's beautiful because all of our tracks are ready to go. Our plugins and tones are ready to go and our songwriting creativity won't be held up by having to start from scratch. That's the beauty of having a template set up and ready for whenever inspiration strikes. If you missed how I did all of this, make sure you watch those first two videos which I've linked for you in the description below. So the first step, uh, if you guys will remember, is to just play the riff. And uh, you guys heard the collection of riffs and the little uh, song that I put together there at the beginning. And the first riff was just something that came to me and it went a little something like this. I liked it faster. So um, anyways, first thing is just to record that into here and then figure out the tempo and tap out the tempo. And I determined that it was 200. So we're gonna go here, but Pro Tools by default starts at 120. We're gonna change this to 200 at the beginning of our session. And what I like to do is I like to give myself a little bit of room at the beginning, maybe like, four or eight bars, so something like this. I got the click track on there. So I'll start right there. And that was, again, that was because that was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, dun, 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 dun. So I'm gonna put myself a marker here, just that's gonna be riff A. So now I have a marker, I know I'm gonna come in there and when I start it, and uh, one little trick too that I like uh, is just leaving myself a little bit of space here in case there's gonna be some intro added on or whatever, which there ended up being, uh, which you may have heard at the beginning, but I'm gonna show you how I did that as well. So I like to leave myself a little bit of space for anything that might come up there, some little swell, some intro, but you can always move those things. You can always move the entire session over. It's just a little more painstaking uh, to do those things after you have a ton of track information in here and things like that. So anyways, we're gonna just gonna do um, four bars there, which is cool. One, two, three four bars, then we're gonna start. So we lay that first riff in there. Then the second riff that I came up with, I thought it'd sound cool. To go into that. So that was the riff and I had that little tail in there and I planned on everything to stop and just one guitar would go dun 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 dun. And that's a cool like little impact trick. Everybody's playing drums and one guitar cut out. So just one guitar is gonna do that and everybody's gonna pop back in and it's gonna be huge for that uh, next riff. So what I did was is I just sang this out and I do this all the time. I sang out the first riff to see how long I wanna go, whatever feels right before the second riff hits. We'll start from the beginning. I'm just gonna hum out this first riff. So right here is gonna be B. Another thing that I forgot to say is when I uh, tap that one out after I recorded it, so I figured out all the tempos first. So. I figured that one out and that one was a little bit slower. That one came up at 195. So it's still there where B hits, I'm gonna put, change my tempo to 195. And I like to do that, uh, I like to record the riffs and figure out the tempos of each individual riff so there can be some flow within the song. So it, does, it isn't just all one tempo the whole time. Sometimes, as I mentioned before, one tempo is totally cool. In this particular case, it felt good. It felt, it had a little more groove to slow that down just slightly. Five BPM isn't that much at all, uh, but that's what felt good there. And you can always adjust this stuff later too, if you know how. That's a totally more advanced thing to, re to adjust the tempo of already recorded audio. Very easy to do with MIDI stuff. If you have bass and drums in there, which we're gonna do, it's very 
easy to adjust, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, in Pro Tools, a lot of that has to do with the ticks and samples here. And when you make tempo changes, as long as it's on ticks there, it will change accordingly. Uh, if you want to do that with recorded audio, like guitars or vocals and stuff like that, you have to go to polyphonic here and, um, and then you can change that to elastic audio and then you switch this over to ticks. But that's a whole nother super complicated lesson on its own. You gotta be careful with that stuff or else you're totally gonna hear. But little tempo changes, you can always get away with. So uh, let's move on to the next thing. I figured out the, uh, the tempo of the third riff, which is... Good to me to go back into it felt real nice to fall back into that um so anyways uh i happened to tap that one out and that one slowed down even a bit again that one slowed down to 190 so let's figure out where that's going to come part c with a tempo change again to 190 so um i could go from the beginning if i want to keep everything fresh but i know what this sounds like i'm coming from riff a dun 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 so um so right here is going to be riff C. And we're going to drop the tempo again there to 190. Okay, and then I said it felt good to go back to riff A there, so let's let's get this guy going. Um, um, Right there. So I'm just watching this carefully and seeing exactly where it's going to go. I'm in grid mode here, so it slaps to the grid. You don't want it to have it off the grid. It'll mess everything up. Um, it may be called something different in Logic or Reaper or whatever you're using, but grid allows it so it snaps to the grid wherever you click or wherever you draw regions or clips. Slip means you can go anywhere in between, stuff like that. So for the sake of this, where you're setting up your grid, you definitely want to be uh, on, uh, on a, a grid marker there. So uh, A2 was going to be at bar 37. So um, I'm just, because it's the same as, as A, I'm going to call it A2. And we knew that that tempo was nice at this black bar, whatever the hell that is. That tempo was good there at uh, 200. But you know what? As I started building this, as I came back into it, I felt like it didn't feel good to go back into 200 that fast. So uh, it felt good at 195. So I'm going to put that back at 195. And it's all about what feels good, you know? That, that was a, like I talked about where... So I just, I just assumed it would go back to 200, but after putting this all together, I'm like, eh, that kind of feels abrupt to go, to jump from 190 all the way back up to 200. So 195 is what felt good to me there. So we're gonna pop that in, and we're gonna close out on 195. Um, so uh, let's just start putting this stuff in, and then I'll show you how I decided to, to, to finish it out. Because this is all that I had in mind when I started structuring the song. And then closing it out, I wanted to see what the, everything sounded like in here first, and then I could make better decisions on how to close out this little segment. So uh, the first step then was to record the left side guitar uh, to the click here. And that's what I did. So that's in there, you can hear it. Then, do the other side. Got those in. Again, this is great because it was already all set up. Got them panned, got my, um, my guitar plug-in on here. Then I'm using all part of my template, EQ'd the way I like the way it sounded before, and that was just a quick EQ job. Again, this isn't really a mix. All my faders, uh, pretty much. Where is my next window here? All my faders are still just at zero, as you can see there. So it's just quick and easy. Don't have to worry about much. Um, then uh, it was a matter of popping in 
the next riff, so I'll do that on the left side. Got it. And the same for the other side. Done. Check this out. Remember I said on one side would drop out there, so I did that in the tracking process. As you can see there, one side drops out, and then everything's gonna pop back in for C here. So let's record the left and the right side of riff C. Done. Here's one super valuable tip too that uh, you don't need to concern yourself with at the moment, but think about this. Right now I've been recording all these to the click, and so that's been my feel. Sometimes I'll always do what I'm doing right now with scratch tracks. Then I'll write in my drums, and when I go back and record for real, I have a better feel of everything because I'm actually playing two drums. So you get a better feel, feeling the kick and the snare versus just a click track. So just keep that in mind. Record your scratch tracks, make your whole skeleton, then write your drums, then go back and redo the guitars for real, making sure all your takes are super clean and everything, and you'll have a better feel because you're playing to the drums themselves. Uh, so we got Riff C in there, sounding good. <laughs> So I wanted to do four more bars of riff A again, so we'll do that. Got it. Okay. So now I kind of decided I'm going to head back to that and then I want to break down the beat. So the beat for that is pretty fast in my mind. And I want to break it down. Like really half time that, uh, like Cannibal Corpse style, Pantera style, you know? Um, definitely you could say Chimera style because that's where we got it from. Pan's like, Animal Corpse and Pantera, just breaking down that halftime, how good that really feels to do something like that. So I decided I wanted to do that, but let me show you first. At this point, I decided I want to put some drums in, like I was saying, um, maybe get some bass in there, just feel everything and decide exactly how I want to hammer the rest of this song out. So I went ahead and wrote some drums to it. There we go. And um, I'll show you what those sound like in a sec. I just, but I'll mention one more time. I go through everything that I'm doing right now in step, step by step, note by note in those first two videos. So if you want to see how I come up with the drums and what I'm thinking about for all that kind of stuff, um, you can do that. But here's what we got. Here's a little sample. Let's check this bad boy out. That's what I came up with in my mind, and that's what I did, and here's what it looks like. All right, so we got A2 there, and then A a again, I doubled that, but it's going to be the halftime version. And um, instead of four bars, it's going to go five bars. I'm going to do three bars of how it normally goes. <laughs> so I felt all that out. And let me put one more marker here. No tempo changes or anything. So this is going to be A3. So it's riff A again the third time. See what that sounds like. You hear what I'm talking about? Cool. 
cool. Got that. So I got my entire structure there. Everything sounded pretty good. And now it's time to throw in some bass. So with the bass, I'm just writing it in MIDI like you saw me do in the past couple videos. And when you're doing bass, the first thing that I'll just start with is kind of just matching the guitar. Uh, but then you kind of feel it out as you're going, oh, it'd be better to do an octave here. It'd be better to match the kick drums here rather than what the guitars are doing. You know, think of what a real bass player might do. Bass, bass players and drummers tend to lock in together and they play more rhythmically than the bass player and the guitar players may play. So you want to keep your, your key the same as the guitars, but a lot of times you just want to follow the bass or the drums because that's what the bass player would typically be doing. So I don't go too crazy thinking about all that um, when I'm just putting something like this together, but I, I certainly keep it all in mind and I try to keep it a little bit interesting. Sometimes you want to do an octave note, sometimes you want to do halftime notes, but again, keeping your melody and key in tune with the guitar uh, is, is what's most important. And then getting your rhythms down with the drums will help it have more impact. So uh, here's what the bass looks like after I pop some in. Okay, bass is in and good to go. We can get rid of this click now. So how I have those guys, they're matching uh, all, everything that's going on with the drums here. And the guitar riff. Then when we go into this halftime part, the whole alto note sounds a lot better, even though the guitars are still doing the same thing. So that's sounding slamming. And now at this point, I said to myself, so I want to put a little, uh, I hear some effects in here and I figured it'd be cool to kind of just show off um, just some, some general type effects that you can do to just sauce up the song a little bit, give it a little bit of impact and stuff. So the first thing I did was uh, I wanted to get some like intro, something that kind of swelled in, you know, uh, you know, I didn't really have anything in mind here just exactly, but um, I just heard like, you know, like, I don't know, yeah, as Pro Tools freezes here. Uh, kind of just thought like something like you know, something like that. So I have a, a big folder of samples, and you guys should put something like that together too. I mean, programs like Final Cut Pro and Pro Tools and iMovie come with just tons of different samples that you can check out, especially like um, instrument software for, for DAWs and stuff like this. I always have just tons of cool samples. Uh, you can find tons of free stuff online. Everybody's giving away free samples. If not, buy something, you know, one $99 purchase would get you some enormous, probably like 30 gigabyte collection of dope ass samples that can apply to everything. Atmospheric, you know, keys, choir, bass type of stuff, you know. Um, there's a million things. I could have used Expand just here in Pro Tools, which I use for my base here but I found uh, some stuff um, let's see uh, I think it was this uh, actually and let me see what I popped in here this is called the grand swirl so I, I was just going through some like atmospheric type stuff and I found this So that had some sounds in it that I thought could be cool, but I like to manipulate it then to make it my own and to make it like what I make it do what I wanted to do. So I thought that that was way too long. Currently it's uh, 20 seconds and I just want something small. So I just found like a section of it that I liked. Okay. I have just a certain section. It's like the middle of it or something like that. And then I have it fade in. I use a fade, um, just a, a straight linear fade there coming in. And then I have a more ramp 
you won't really hear this fading out underneath when everything busts in, but that's what type of little, little, just little tricks that keeps things smooth. If I would have just cut this off, like right here, um, you know, completely, oops. If I would have just cut this off, it would have just died right here. And you wouldn't notice that much. Still cool, but having it in there still leads it just fade out underneath a little bit, nice and smooth. subtleties make the difference. Could be good subtleties or bad subtleties. Bad subtleties that accumulate create problems. So I found out where I wanted it, what section of that, found out how I wanted it to come in and I made it just, just like this. Next thing I heard was over here I wanted something to happen, something atmospheric over the next riff. I don't know, uh, could be a million things. Could be something droning. Could have been something, like I said, like something like wow, 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 some siren. I don't know. Uh, but what I found was this guy, a tonal riser. So I thought that would sound cool. And listen, you can hear it here. Okay, so check this out. Here's what it looked like initially. Oh, wait. It just looks like this. That's exactly what you heard when I played straight from the sample bank. But it would just stop. Okay, I have a reverb plugin on there too, which I'll talk about. Oh, one last thing about this um, about this first sample too. Something else I did to it. It was just a mono signal before, so it was just kind of straight up the middle and didn't doesn't sound quite as good as a big wide open sample. So uh, my favorite spatial uh, widening plugin here is this micro little micro shift from Sound Toys. Super cool, and it just spreads things out. I use it all the time on vocals, every once in a while on solos, certainly on effects, like delays on the ends of solos and stuff, but tons on vocals. If you only have one vocal track, he's like, uh, I don't know, bring the truth or something like that. You can make it go like, bring the truth and suck back in because you can automate that mix knob. So just real cool stuff for widening mono tracks out or other things. So I put that on there. Um, but again, now let's listen to this riser here for part B here with no verb at the end. It'll just stop. Listen. See? And that's that cutoff. Like, I don't like that. Would you really hear that in the mix? Yes, you do in that case. So unless you want that perfect, which I didn't, I could put this, I put a little reverb on it. Now, typically you get the most flexibility out of sending things like verbs and delays. You send it to an auxiliary uh, bus, you know, and you can have an effects palette that you can just have more flexibility in terms of what's being applied to the dry signal, where this now is all 100% wet signal because I have the uh, plugin here as an insert. But in this case, it's okay. And this Waves True Verb plugin, they say is kind of meant to just put on a track, but I still like to use it. It's my favorite verb plugin, and I still like to use it just as an effect send and return. But in this case, I just put it right on there and listen to what it does to the end. Perfect. It kills so there isn't just a cutoff. But I actually took it a step further. Check out this trick. I do this all the time. So the verb isn't really necessary after what I'm going to do, but I still leave it on. But I'm going to mute it right now so you can see this. Check this out. I'm going to take this. I'm going to duplicate it. See how this is This is a ramp here. It gets, this is what they call risers. It's, it's small, then it gets big. Okay, so if I duplicate it, it's the same thing. It's just going to get small and then get big again. But I'm going to reverse this. Now, it's like this. So it like does the job of that verb because it's coming in and then it's reversed on its way out. Sometimes you got to treat the, the middle of this though because you can hear the little pop. You, won't, you wouldn't really hear that in the mix. But just a little fade. Sometimes you need a little more treatment. Now, does the job of that verb, and I'm still going to put the verb on. You hear that little cut in there? I don't really like it. I'd spend some time treating that. But the verb smooths it right out. Listen, you don't even hear that. So 
See how nice that is? And then I put some fades on there. That's how I decided to have it. Perfect. That sounds cool. Brought the volume on that down a little bit. And then I felt good, it felt good to do it again right here. So that's what I did. I automated the volume down on this one a little bit. Things don't take, even though I just copy and pasted this over to here because I like the way it sounded in that spot as well, I brought the volume of this one down a little bit. Didn't need to be quite as, uh, as dramatic in there. Um, from there, then when we get into the slamming part, I wanted to add some hits to the kick and snare. Like some big amble hit, ding, something like that on those big snares, you know, like Slipknot with the bats against the kegs, um, where, but, but I think Fear Factory were the guys that, that I started hearing that with eventually, uh, or early on, um, you know, they'd have big pings on like snares and, and cool stuff like that. So uh, again, just went through my samples. Let's see, I found this impact and this plank. They don't sound super great, but with some verb, it might be pretty cool. So I found a few of those, a couple of those, and I popped them in in these spots, and here's what it sounds like. So again, the purple sounds like this. Those are gonna be on like my downbeats, I think. Actually, these are gonna be downbeats. Those are those. I wanted a different verb, so I brought those, th these hits up on that different track. What you can do, I have these verbs set up a little bit different. Right now, this is a medium plate, and this is a cathedral. The cathedral is way bigger of a, a verb. So those are gonna be in my snare. So this is gonna be, this purple one here is gonna be the downbeat when it hits, and then you'll hear I have another one on the snare and snare over here. You hear that? Here's without. Listen to that first snare. Now here it is with it. Listen to that first snare again. Here comes another one, downbeat. And I just put those in there quietly because if I didn't have them there, even though the, the drums had picked back up, it sounded too small after having a big part. So I had to think about that. I made this big part where the kick and snares sound big, and then I just needed to treat those additional snares just a little bit after that with a little bit. There we have it, ladies and gentlemen. So again, point of this, um, you know, I just went through this quickly because I explained everything note by note in those first couple videos. But you guys wanted some heavier stuff and I thought, hey, I got heavy stuff all day. So um, just ripped this one out and this is what I can do because of this template I have set up and what I'm trying to show you guys, you can apply these principles to any DAW that you're using. Um, and hopefully you just pick up little tips and tricks here and there. Um, remembering that in your mixes, things like, like uh, effects and stuff like that can add atmosphere or dynamics or um, you know just different vibes and moods to different parts you know you want to beef up drums and stuff like that hits impacts when a chorus hits or some big verse hits or some big breakdown having an impact on the downbeat or the snares or whatever um, but you know be tasteful with it at the same time so just wanted to show you how I think about stuff a little bit here again hope to be helpful appreciate everybody watching if you made it this far give the video a thumbs up for me and I really appreciate you guys watching all the love that everybody's shown uh, so far on all this has been fantastic uh, everybody that's that's been getting something from it mission accomplished you know interested in supporting check out my patreon campaign which would be awesome you know lots of perks in there you can get behind the scenes see this stuff early before it comes out um other cool stuff too for the music i got coming up also if you're interested in guitar playing stuff i got my guitar hot my, my guitar dvd through the rock house method you can check out i'm signing sending out myself worldwide and my uh kemper tone crate bundle where you can get the classic camera tones if you have a kemper profiling amp all that stuff is available in the description below or from robarnoldworld.com. Thanks, guys. And as always, appreciate you watching, and I'll see you on the next one.